Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, welcome to the Department of Economics at the Neo de Manila University and at the Neo Center for Economic Research and Development Seminar Series. We hope you enjoyed our short virtual tour of the campus. So maybe next semester or next year, we would be able to step again in the halls of the university. But this semester, um, let us have a very productive online, online exchange, okay? So this morning, um, before I introduce the speaker for this morning's seminar, let me again remind you of our house rules for those of you who are um, always attending our seminar. You already know this, but for those of you who is who's, um, this is the first time that, that they are joining us, um, please be reminded that we will let the speaker finish his presentation first before we entertain questions. Zoom participants, kindly stay muted and stop sharing your video during the duration of the presentation. During Q&A, um, please virtually raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. You may unmute and show yourself when asking your questions and let us know your institutional affiliation. Participants on Facebook, please post your questions on the comment section and let us know your institutional affiliation as well. Slide videos and other materials from the seminar are posted on our website only when the speaker gives his consent for sharing them. And this morning, our speaker already gave his consent. And we are lucky to have this morning as a speaker, Professor James Rumaset, who is a professor emeritus in the economics department and New Hero Research Fellow both at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. His research centers on applications on, of public policy, including behavior and organization in agriculture, economic development, energy and water economics, ecological resource economics, and competition policy. He has previously held positions at UC Davis, the University of the Philippines, Australian National University, Yale, the University of Maryland, the International Rice Research Institute, and the World Bank, where he worked as, long, as a long-term consultant on irrigation economics. He was dissertation advisor for some Filipino economists you may know, including Arsenio Balisacan, who is on the audience, I believe, Ramon Carete, Carl Handok, Bruce Tolentino, and yours truly. Um, without further ado, I give you Professor James Rumaset for his presentation on competition policy for economic development. Um, Jim, your the virtual floor is yours. Okay. To go to the next slide, push, let's begin. And let's see if it works. Doesn't work. There. Okay, so. Uh, this is just an overview. So we'll go over the traditional theory behind uh, competition policy and then talk about some of the elements that need to be added and that will lead to some conclusions. So the traditional, in the traditional role, first of all, we should always remember the role of government is to promote the common good that's in the Philippine uh, constitution. And we'll show that uh, competition maximizes welfare via the invisible hand, something all economists are familiar with. Monopoly decreases welfare, therefore government should guard against monopoly. That's the traditional case. So, as uh, the good witch Glinda put it, it's always best to start at the beginning. So everything in microeconomics is based on the Nike principle, except we add something. Just do it until marginal benefit equals marginal cost. In this case, this leads directly to the demand and supply curves, producers do it, that is increase production until the marginal benefits, the price equals the marginal cost. 
consumers do it, consume, until their marginal cost, which is the price, equals their marginal benefit. And happily, that leads to a maximization of welfare, the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus. So it's called the fundamental theorem of welfare economics. So that tells you how important economists think that is. However, we have market failure in some cases. For example, monopoly decreases welfare. So monopolists have a different marginal benefit. Their marginal benefit is the marginal revenue because every time they lower the price to increase sales, they lower the price on all the previous units that they're selling. So you see there that marginal benefit equals marginal cost at a much lower quantity than the previously mentioned competitive equilibrium. As a result, we get deadweight loss. So that's the case for competition policy. It's not going. Hmm. I don't seem to be able to go to the next slide. Jim, the arrow key on your keyboard. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Click, yeah. on, the, click on the PowerPoint, not the screen. Uh, I mean, the, maybe you are clicking on the screen for of your, I know. You know, when I hit the key on the keyboard, the down key, nothing happens. Uh, there's a lot of messages coming in on people that need to be admitted. I don't know if that's interfering. No, no, no. Ignore that. Ignore that. But... Um, Uh, do you want to control it or something? Okay. Uh, okay. Um. Do you see it? Yeah. Okay. There. Okay, so we want to go beyond the traditional view. And that's going to require understanding the causes. Why do firms depart from competition in the first place? Um, we we'll also need to go beyond static economics. So most of traditional microeconomics is just static, those supply and demand curves. But we need to know about dynamics. Uh, in particular, what part of dynamics increase productivity? And we'll talk about innovation, specialization, and interdependent investments. So that's the extension that we're searching for. And this is something that's very much in process in, as I mentioned before, it hasn't really been developed. Next. It turns out that the causes of monopoly were understood way back by Adam Smith. He has his famous quote, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So Olson's law of large groups uh, puts a little more meat on the bones. Uh, he says, the larger the group, the more difficult it is to organize. So producers can easily collude 
but consumers can't organize very effectively to block them, say by a boycott or something. And Arrow put it even more succinctly, it is not the presence of bargaining costs per se, but their bias that is relevant. Now, Stigler developed what we call capture theory, pointing out that even if you have regulation to offset that tendency, the conspiracy may still capture the regulator. And there's a famous example in the US how the Texas Railroad Commission, which you would think has nothing to do with oil, succeeded in establishing quotas on behalf of the oil companies to limit production and therefore enforce monopoly power. Next. So one question that comes up in uh, competition authorities is should we be trying for consumer or total welfare? Now, since the bias in bargaining costs is the problem and consumers are disadvantaged, competition policy can partially restore welfare by acting on behalf of consumers. Long ago, Galbraith called this the countervailing force. So the best way to promote total welfare may be promoting consumer welfare. Now, there's a little warning as we saw, we have to be aware of special interests seeking to influence the regulator. Next. So this is your own PCC chairman, Bali Sakon's theory of how interest groups operate to both form monopolies and to influence public policy. So on the right, it's the Nike rule again, the optimal membership in an organization is determined by the marginal benefits of the organization versus the marginal organizational costs. And on the left, it tells you how to get the marginal benefits. The more people join the group, the more it's worthwhile to invest, that's the horizontal axis, invest in political influence. So we have some insights on the why. Next. So we need to talk about economic development, which is just growth plus structural change. So start with growth theory. This is a quick course, one minute course in growth theory. So starting off with the dismal science, the classical economists, Malthus and Ricardo said that growth occurs because you're adding more and more population to a fixed resource base. But that means diminishing marginal returns and we end up with a stationary state. Very dismal outlook. Solo was a little bit more optimistic in formulating neoclassical economics, showing that, well, if you add capital faster than labor grows, then you can, have, you can increase per capita income. But this slows to a constant rate of technical change, which is maybe something like 1%. So again, not that optimistic. So finally, we get to endogenous growth theory, which is really underlying ambish, ambition not in 2040. And I capitalized the first three letters because A and B was the one that invented this. So in endogenous growth theory, it's not necessary to have declining growth to a steady state level of technical change. Because of the economies of human capital and specialization and things we'll talk about you can possibly have a maintain for a long time, a constant rate of growth. So that's another reason why you might call the target of 7% growth, uh, Daang Matawid. The, the Daan is Matawid because, 
not just because of anti-corruption policies, but because of endogenous growth theory, we can, uh, we can maintain a constant growth rate. Next. The other part of economic development is structural transformation. So uh, Lucas, Nobel Prize winner in economics, has a famous article about growth in Korea for about a thousand years hardly was positive. Um, maybe something less than 1%. But eventually intensification within agriculture, specialization and capital accumulation are sufficient for a surplus, which provides positive linkages to industrialization. And then growth really takes off fed by capital accumulation, not only produced capital, but human and knowledge capital, and increased specialization, uh, accelerate growth. Uh, finally, the service industry grows faster than industry, but that's largely because uh, it's really facilitating transactions. You can think of modern service services such as uh, real estate, banking, and uh, the internet, which are connecting people and make it, making it easier to uh, make deals. Next. Danny Roderick is, uh, I guess, the top economist at Harvard. And he likes to point out that the dynamics are more important than the statics. <coughs> And here he is portraying the small deadweight loss triangle that you've heard about in static economics. And he's saying that the productivity gains are much more important. He also points out that innovation in institutions is important as well. Next. So three sources of productivity we'll talk about. The first one is innovation and Schumpeter was the master of this in economics. And he pointed out that the fascination with competitive equilibrium is unhelpful in some ways because if we were really at a competitive equilibrium, there wouldn't be any innovation. And the innovation that matters or the competition that really matters is that for new technologies, products, organizational forms and sources of supply. Next, isn't that ironic? Next. So, uh, firms compete to earn a higher market share. That's the same irony. They're trying to be not competitive. If they ever got to perfect competition, they'd stop doing all that. So in this churning, market churning, selection provides a function of new firms entering and old firms exiting, what Schumpeter called creative destruction. And at any point in time, some firms have high profits, some firms have negative profits. Next. So there's a textbook dilemma that sometimes you hear since Schumpeter said, well, some degree of monopoly rents helps the firm to have retained earnings invested in research and development and provide innovation. What if this happens? Suppose we started at the ordinary competitive equilibrium where demand equals marginal cost, MCC, and then the quantity is QC. And then the firms organized, let's say they formed a cartel and acted as a monopolist. And they were able to innovate. So they lowered the cost, the marginal cost to MCM. And now the monopolistic 
equilibrium is at Q sub M. And we see that under that scenario, the producer gain is more than the consumer loss. So question is, should this be allowed? And uh, we're gonna argue that that couldn't happen. And so let's see why. Next slide. So Agion and company did empirical research on this and found out that, well, there is a Schumpeter effect on the left, on the right side of this curve, you see that innovation could actually go down with too much competition. But the peak is something like 80 to 95%. That is uh, cost, marginal cost goes up and up and up as the system gets more competitive until you get to 100%, that would be perfect competition. But in the Philippines, the competition in index is only about 60%. So there's a lot more room to be more competitive and still get greater innovation. Next. Second source of productivity is specialization. So within manufacturing, especially, there's abundant opportunities for both horizontal and vertical specialization. So that's why as that sector grows, the growth rate of the whole economy goes up. It's quite remarkable in history of in England, you can see a break in the growth rate around 1869 when manufacturing was becoming more important and the whole growth rate of the economy took off along with uh, wages. Now, the other thing that's going on to facilitate the specialization is the falling unit transaction costs. So think of the cost of transporting a good uh, of one ton by one kilometer. So as this infrastructure, including institutional infrastructure grows, we get falling transaction costs and there's so much increase in specialization that the transaction sector itself, even though the unit cost is falling, it actually grows. So there's a huge increase in specialization that's fueling economic development. Also, as, as more well understood, uh, trade is growing, increasing specialization, hopefully following a dynamic comparative advantage. Next. So this is, um, you've heard of the expression uh, somebody moves and they took, let's say a company moves location and they took lock, stock and barrel. That means they took everything. Well, here we're using uh, lock, stock and barrel uh, literally to understand how specialization works. So in the US uh, early on, let's say, I don't know, 1840 or so, <clears throat> um, Rifle makers such as Colt, Winchester, and Remington were making their own parts. Eventually, the market grew enough so that special, uh, specialized intermediate producers <coughs> could produce the lock, stock, and barrel. But initially, they had to do it to make it interchangeable. Those parts like the, the lock or the barrel could be taken off one gun and put on another gun. Yeah. And that's because the market wasn't big enough. So that's what Smith and Nobel Prize winner Stigler said, specialization is limited by the extent of the market. As the market grows, there's more and more specialization. So eventually 
Winchester could have their own producer of the stock. So it could be specialized and tailored to diverse preferences. So this allows for horizontal specialization, which caters to Stiglitz and Dixit's uh, preference for diversity, which is another source of economic growth. So you can think, you can see how that's never ending because the horizontal specialization doesn't have to stop and neither does the vertical specialization because you can have parts of the lock, stock and barrel and so on. And because of the economies of scale embedded in those specialized products, that becomes a source of productivity growth. Next. So of course, I should, I should add, we don't want to do anything with competition policy that's going to mess that up. So the third uh, source of productivity growth is coordinating investments. And this is known as the assurance problem. I remember UPLB professors telling me how they gave high yielding cucumber seeds to farmers thinking they were doing a good thing. And the farmers used the seeds, grew the cucumbers and found out there was no market. So they brought the, the cucumbers and dumped them on the professor's doorstep. So that illustrates this coordination problem. You have a farmer and a trucker really representing the whole marketing system whether it uh, includes going to Divisoria or in more modern times, uh, hooking up with uh, supermarket chains. So we have these two elements and they need to coordinate their investment. So the win-win outcome is if they both invest, they get 10, 10, they both get 10 payoffs. If they don't invest, of course, they get no extra payoffs at all, that's zero. And if they invest and the other person doesn't, they lose 20. So this is called the, the zero zero outcome is called the risk dominant Nash equilibrium, because if you don't have assurance, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take the risk. So that's an important aspect of development policy. Next. It's also called the double trust dilemma, the problem of coordinating uh, interdependent investments. This also applies to innovation since they require coordinating invention and finance. Next. So we usually say there's three ways to solve these externality problems. One would be with futures markets. That's too costly. We don't really imagine having futures markets for trucking services and cucumbers. Uh, the second one is selective incentives. This is the Pigouvian approach. <laughs> so the state can put on subsidies, tax breaks, and so on, to try to incentivize the coordination. Of course, that requires an awful lot of knowledge. So they may get it wrong. And as some of you may still remember the writings of John Power on the Philippines always said, this is susceptible to Band-Aid economics. You get one incentive, things go wrong and you have to put on another Band-Aid. So the third one is quite promising, direct cooperation, and that can take different forms. Could be through contracting. Uh, famously, Korea and Japan uh, are noted for the Karetsu and Chebol. So, there can be varying degrees of top-down coercion. I mean, you could imagine going all the way to 
communism with this model, or you could go, all, the other extreme is going all the way to contracts, dis decentralized contracts. But these conglomerates were a good way of coordinating investments, and at the same time, a mechanism for coordinating with uh, government planning. So I like to think of uh, Kim sang jo the previous uh, chairman of the Korea Fair Trade Commission. And he was very popular in Korea for being the chable sniper. So the story was that he was very tough on the tables. But in a, in a conference a few years ago when he was in Manila, he said that he actually loves tables. <coughs> which is a very nice illustration that you need both sides. You need to, you recognize that there are non-market mechanisms of coordination, which you want to leave there. At the same time, if there's too much cooperation, there can be abuse, there can be excesses. So the competition authority comes in very important in, in being able to curb those abuses. Next. So some on the, we might say on the Chicago school or the UCLA school, especially in, back in the days of uh, Friedman and Demsets and nowadays George Mason, that there's some opposition to competition policy saying it could make matters worse. So they were especially focusing on the possibility that the competition authority would be influenced by special interests. And Friedman notably augmented this argument with the point that we don't need competition authority in the first place because you have imports. So if you liberalize your trade policy, then the imports can provide the competition you need. And the producers will be price takers once again. Um, of course, that's a limited argument because that only applies to traded goods. So if you have globalization, it's going to increase incomes, demand for non-traded goods, and that's going to exacerbate the deadweight loss of monopoly that's still occurring in non-traded goods. So in that way, it could make matters worse if you don't have a way to limit monopoly power. Um, at the same time, bringing in the competition with non-traded goods will make them more competitive. That will in turn uh, make exports more competitive. So there's a, there's a mutual beneficial relationship there. So the conclusion is we still need competition policy to appropriate the full benefits of trade that that's not an adequate substitute. Okay, here's a few points on uh, just uh, the good, bad, and ugly of competition. So we already went over the Schumpeter um, competing to make a better mousetrap, or it could be methods of production or even a better business model. That's how competition acts through creative destruction. But keep in mind, there's also bad competition we're trying to guard against. My favorite uh, example, because it's so graphic, is that uh, Al Capone simply murdered his competition, a guy named Lobanian, when he was walking out of a flower shop, just had him murdered. But there's also, an, and we have the rule of law that's supposed to control against that, but there's also uh, legal harassment. You can 
sue competitors for this and that and increase their costs and things like predatory pricing. So we need the competition authority to guard against those things. Finally, the ugly of uh, competition is government policies may sometimes reduce competition. So for example, uh, in the Philippines, you have the example of government control of agricultural markets, rice, corn, and coconut oil. Uh, back in the days of uh, Cory Aquino, uh, her cement policy under uh, the, the Secretary of Trade and Industry, Concepcion, along with uh, GMA at that time was, was his undersecretary. He said, um, okay, here's our cement policy. One cement policy in the North and one cement, or one cement company in the North and one cement company in the South. And I get to choose who it is. So you can see how uh, that's an extreme example, but you can see how government can actually restrict competition. Next. Um, just a reminder, as we said in the beginning, the objective is to promote the general welfare. Uh, competition policy should be viewed as an instrument to that general goal, not to increase competition per se. <clears throat> um, competition policy can also play an active role instead of just responding to complaints and requests for approval. Uh, they can do market review and priority, uh, prioritize which are the worst sectors that need to be fixed first. And that can include government monopolies. Um, we may have some, we, we have some experts that, that can perhaps tell us later how that's going. Next. Um, so as we said, competition policy should be integrated with other policies, agricultural policies, industry and trade policies. So you have a industrial policy with competition as a part of it. And I'm, somebody may also wanna to speak to the national competition policy administrative order by Duterte in October that uh, looks very promising because it looks like a mechanism for PCC to coordinate with uh, NADA and other departments in getting an industrial policy that has all of these aspects we've been talking about. Of course, as we said, uh, uh, all agencies should follow the Hippocratic Oath of Government first do no harm. So, uh, for example, by decreasing competition. Next. Okay. So um, I think we've said most of this. Competition policy is a means to enhance the ability of markets to deliver economic welfare by acting on behalf of consumers to countervail against the fundamental bias in transaction costs, uh, to act as a check on otherwise legal tactics to accelerate exit while restraining entry, including collaboration with government entities, and to appropriate the full benefits of trade, uh, that is complement sectoral trade, R&D, and investment policies. To help Garner productivity gains, competition policy enhances specialization without impeding innovation and the coordination of investments. So again, this active approach is indicated, uh, choosing priority sectors and priorities for action and coordination with industrial and trade policies. So, I'm just about out of time. I'll leave you with the following questions. 
So I won't I won't go over those, but um, up to our moderator, if we want to, uh, if we have time, we'll we'll try to ask somebody about these. These are things that I don't have the answers to myself. Thank you. Hey, mahalo, Jim. And thank you for sticking with the time. Okay, so uh, let me just fix my screen. Okay, so we have about um, 115 participants on Zoom. Um, you're popular, Jim. So we are now ready to entertain questions from the audience. And I see that Sutad is very eager to ask the first question. So let me give the floor to Sutad. So that's Ed Bunsan, the chairman of the board of the International Rice Research Institute. Hi, Jim. Hi, Sutai. Uh, I have a question, Jim, about uh, the, 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 the So that we lost you. Okay, so we lost that. We'll entertain another question. Okay, so that you're muted. Okay, okay. okay. I'm okay now. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, there you the, are. Uh, right. <laughs> Again, my question is about the, the the demand side, the consumer side, which we try to protect the benefit, their welfare. We know that they are less organized because the cost of organizing them uh, to balance the market is less than the producer. The, transac the transaction cost has now um, markedly uh, uh, reduced because we have new technology on information. So that can help better coordination among the consumer. But the direction that the competition uh, measures, policy measures that we have now, the toolbox are full of the supply side. We emphasize to control the producer and we are not promoting the coordination of the consumer. Is that a, a, a way to balance that or, or, or should we emphasize that more going forward in the future in this age of digital economy? Thank you. Yeah, interesting. Um, one question is whether the consumer authority could be even a more effective um, champion the, the competition authority could be a more effective champion of consumers in this new age where communication is uh, easier that would be one path and another path would be are there other ways that consumers can organize even outside of the competition authority um and one could look for examples of that. I'm not sure myself. Yeah, but I understand. I understand. Good point. Okay. Let me entertain another question. Um, PCC Chairman R.C. Balisakan is raising his hand. You may unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Ma. Uh, good to hearing you again, Jim. Um, very Thank interesting you. seminar as always. Uh, uh, among the three sources of productivity uh, growth that uh, you um, highlighted, innovation, specialization, and investment coordination, I think uh, at least in the Philippine context, there's a good enough appreciation of innovation. Uh, but the other two, specialization and investment coordination, appears to be quite uh, comparatively uh, weaker in, the, in that context. And all these three um, are all quite, um, or, or require uh, 
uh, quite a different perspective that is uh, hardly appreciated in many uh, outside of economics. Uh, and that is this the dynamics uh, um, aspects as, as opposed to the static uh, uh, considerations. I'm saying this because uh, uh, if you bring an issue to uh, the courts uh, where um, uh, say a, a competition uh, ruling uh, uh, by PCC uh, would uh, ultimately end up when uh, the decision is appealed. Uh, uh, the evidence is always the key, you know, the evidence that you can, uh, uh, that parties can, sh uh, can show. And uh, by the very nature of that evidence, these are um, quite static and, and then so uh, invisible hand is not uh, is not is not an evidence, you know. So you can the, uh, talk about the, the uh, benefits of competition using the invisible hand as an argument. Um, um, that would not be uh, accepted. Uh, uh, so uh, I guess the issue is uh, that um, uh, uh, because of this uh, very. Um, uh, I think I, I, I see that that it's also uh, happens in, in in the U.S. in the Federal Trade Commission, where you know the static uh, gains uh, uh, or considerations uh, appear to uh, uh, dominate uh, uh, the uh, discussions uh, rather than the uh, dynamic ones, which are sometimes, of course, difficult to quantify and where the evidence is not quite direct. Um, so I guess the question for the competition uh, uh, issue is, uh, uh, um, is with respect to specialization and coordination, um, how, how best can we can a competition authority um, uh, work with the, uh, with their partners in governments so as to uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, exploit those uh, sources of pro productivity gains. Uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, and your advice. Uh, you you, you, you uh, talked about the active versus passive uh, approach, uh, and I think a good part of our work at PCC is uh, is advocacy um, and uh, doing. Uh, uh, scoping studies, uh, market studies, issuing issues papers, precisely to understand the uh, competition issues in each of the markets and get a, uh, a, a perspective of, on the bigger picture. Um, and so, ideally, um, uh, we would, you know, we would want to proceed along the line uh, that is theoretically. Uh, uh, Correct. That is uh, starting first with the uh, highly distorted sectors and uh, move on from there. Uh, but there are uh, uh, quite uh, severe uh, limitations uh, uh, usually, and that uh, includes, uh, you know, that uh, when a complaint is lodged to the agency, uh, uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it cannot be ignored. It, it has to be uh, brought in and and uh, and. Um, uh, ruled by the commission, and that's where uh, we can get into some problems, uh, uh, especially if uh, 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 members of the commission, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, are uh, you know, um, are, are, are can't appreciate uh, the dynamic issues and are are uh, um, confined to the uh, to what uh, may be um, considered as. Uh, as uh, uh, evidential uh, um, or, 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 or things that require uh, uh, clear evidence that uh, would be needed uh, uh, in case uh, uh, the matter is, is uh, elevated to the courts. In other words, uh, everything that uh, you, you put forward has to be accepted uh, uh, by uh, by the courts. Of course. Uh, uh, it is also our obligation to uh, continue deciding on cases even if they are outside of the norms uh, because this will build on into the body of jurisprudence for uh, uh, for competition and uh, we are also aware of that so jim let me stop there because i think that your that your policy implications are fully loaded <laughs> and i would like a, a more a longer discussion on that
Thank you. Thank you, Maha. Sorry for the long intervention. Jim, do you want to respond? Well, yeah, it's easy to be overwhelmed by events, especially the high profile cases that come up. Um, the, the one thing that I could add is um, in the, you have two mechanisms for paying attention to specialization and investment coordination. One is industrial policy, and I guess including the, the, co the, the administrative order to coordinate with uh, PCC. So that's already a invitation for PCC to be closely working with NADA in, in looking at industrial policy, and that would include an evaluation. Are we paying proper attention to opportunities for specialization, and are we ignoring some barriers to investment coordination? Yeah. Okay, so we have several people raising their hands. I'll be calling them as they uh, raise their hands. First, um, Bruce Tolentino, BSP Monetary Board Member. Hi, Jim. Good Hi, to Bruce. listen to you again. Um, your remarks tell me that uh, the competition authority just cannot sit and wait for complaints as you directly stated and it the competition authority needs to be very proactive if not aggressive and highly visible in its uh, work and uh, stand up as an advocate for the consumer uh, and and be highly engaged in in public discourse uh, not only in the courts but in uh, policy making circles and uh, even in public uh, debate. Uh, what do you think about that? Of course, it's impossible to uh, disagree. I, I think I put on one of my questions the tension, the difficulty that the PCC faces in, on the one hand, doing all this. Uh, work on behalf of the consumer and at the same time how do you avoid becoming so much of a contribida that you become less effective i mean after all if you can remove the uh, chairman of the supreme court or the chief justice of the supreme court then nobody's really completely independent so, I mean, I don't know if RC wants to address that. How do you balance? I mean, he's been, been able, oh, so have you, but been able to work with uh, several governments and have the reputation of being nonpartisan. That's part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Maha, can I just respond oh, quickly? Okay. Uh, yeah, to, 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 yeah, I think Jim uh, yeah, and Bruce, that's a good point. Uh, uh, the way the commission proceeds uh, uh, um, is um, uh, that every year, uh, based on, on our scoping of the of the landscape, we uh, set our priorities. Uh, those priorities are are defined by the uh, things like uh, uh, importance of the sector or the markets in the. In the economy, in, in overall growth, uh, uh, importance on consumers, and so on and so forth, including the possibility, the probability that uh, you succeed in that in that uh, case. So, if you don't uh, swallow everything that you know that is presented to us, we have to have a way of filtering the the uh, so many demands uh, uh, in such a way that we can uh, have a better probability of succeeding. Um, so that's one consideration. The other uh, point that I made uh, that I, I mentioned earlier is that uh, we don't usually identify uh, um, uh, and proceed in, in, in directions without the guidance of our internal work as well as those uh, done by others. And so 
we depend a lot on uh, on competition studies, market studies, issue studies. Uh, we are very active there, and, and and finally we do a lot of advocacy efforts, uh, 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 particularly in Congress, because what we realize is that um, if we um, it, it's so hard, it's so time consuming, it's so very costly to litigate a competition uh, uh, case uh, exposed no? um, because uh, of the legal uh, processes. Uh, and it's not unusual in any country. Uh, uh, even in the Europe, it, they, they usually take five to 10 years to, uh, you know, to, to conclude the cartel case, uh, even in the US. Uh, and, and so it's very time consuming. Uh, but on the other hand, if you can inject already competition, uh, perspectives into the law that is passed by Congress, then you solve a lot of future problems. And we have succeeded that uh, in that direction uh, a number of times. And we are very pleased to mention that, that we played a key role in the tele telco, for example, uh, the regulation in the Public Services Act, uh, Philippine Competition Commission is again uh, put in there as part of the parties to be consulted in, uh, on uh, when it comes to uh, you know, public uh, services and utilities uh, by foreign invest, uh, investment by foreign parties. No? So we got that. But the other thing with respect to uh, uh, coordination with agencies, and that's why we are also quite selective, is that uh, other agencies too are quite good in capitalizing uh, uh, on, uh, you know, uh, uh, the media and they are announced they you know they make a case about cartel here cartel there and then when we look into the case uh, ask the agency for assistance they have nothing to show uh, and i uh, uh, and that's the case for some of the agricultural cases we have uh, and and so you know it uh, it's one thing to say you know that there's a problem of cartel here but when we get there we ask for uh, for information, uh, there's nothing that the agency will uh, uh, will show. So, despite you know making a, a, a uh, such a, a big thing uh, in the media, so those are the realities that we see in the competition authority, and and uh, we're learning a lot from there. Okay. So, who is who is getting the evidence say, on uh, agriculture markets? In rice, it's a hot topic. So well, 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 now, now we are coordinating. We are we have our own team now. Uh, we are coordinating with the NBI because we can't get the evidence from agencies that would should have been otherwise been cooperating. Uh, uh, just to ensure that uh, there is a really case. And that, uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, there are studies that we do uh, internally and. Uh, and show, showing us where we should focus on, on our uh, 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 competition concerns because some of those leads that uh, were provided did, uh, uh, did not show any, a, a, any uh, uh, promising uh, prospects. Uh, so. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Uh, let me call on uh, Marilu Uy, Director of the G24 Secretariat, and who will be our speaker on March 9th. Marilu. Thanks very much, Maha. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed the presentation, Jim. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I just have a quick question uh, in that, um, and perhaps it's a question more for Arsi than for you, but <laughs> let me try. Um, the regulatory authorities as, uh, are largely within national, operate within national boundaries, no? But a major uh, trend in the past decades, of course, is the growth of multinationals, especially now with the digital platforms. So, uh, and companies cross borders. And so the, the, the World Development Report of the World Bank a few years ago pointed out some concerns about um, kind of car cartel-like behavior or some anti-competitive practices, um, not quite fully fleshed out. So um, the so the regulatory authorities face major challenges, no, uh, to coordinate, but also <laughs> to detect exactly what what the anti-competitive practices are. So um, the I don't I don't expect the big answers right now. Um, maybe RC will answer, <laughs> but um, but the question is uh, how will it fit your framework, and I mean how will it 
what kind of extensions to the questions you, uh, of your framework that you might want to, to build in uh, to capture these phenomena. Thank you. Yeah, so I think you are the expert on multinationals and uh, we can indeed see a similarity between the need to cooperate on tax policies because uh, there's beggar thy neighbor tax policies to try to get multinationals to invest in your country. So at the same time, we would expect there may be a temptation to go soft on multinationals just to get them to invest, but then the whole group of countries uh, will be the loser by those practices. So um, do you have any more to say about the prospects or do, shall we ask Arcee to address that, how to coordinate the competition policies? I don't think you need to, sometimes this word harmonize is misunderstood. It means people take it to mean we should all have the same policy. I don't think that's necessary. We could solve the problem with, with coordination. Even, I mean, Roderick loves institutional diversity. So we should respect institutional diversity and different competition authorities having different uh, ways of doing business and different rules, but they can still coordinate with respect to multinationals. RC, are you going to say something? Well, if you let me respond there. Very quick. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I think the, the point made by Marilu is very useful because I I heard, I was in a, a conference one time with uh, the former uh, World, uh, World Bank chief economist, uh, Penelope uh, Woodberg, uh, and she was, she presented this, uh, this uh, cartel cases uh, in Africa uh, uh, where, you know, uh, uh, governments uh, in uh, in those countries uh, were quite uh, 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 lax with respect to uh, anti-competitive uh, practices brought in by by multinationals, no? and that's uh, uh, Professor Goldberg was saying that this is one thing that you should, that uh, countries should uh, in the developing countries should really be uh, worried about. Uh, and so here at uh, at home, uh, we do realize that there are. Uh, Transborder uh, uh, issues, uh, uh, especially uh, 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 you know the uh, uh, the uh, digital, for example, now and pharmaceutical and other uh, yeah, and even agri agri products, agri uh, uh, biotech firms. Uh, uh, and what we do is uh, uh, is to coordinate, uh, and we have a very quite active coordination with uh, other competition authorities. Uh, especially in ASEAN, you know. uh, when they, we had a case, for example, uh, on the uh, 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 grab over uh, merger, uh, where uh, we also blocked that, uh, we tried to block it, uh, and uh, we came too late, but uh, uh, different jurisdictions um, uh, shared information about uh, our approach, you know, how we can approach the issue without uh, necessarily you know, accepting that what works for them uh, will, uh, will also work for us, but that sharing of, uh, of uh, information and uh, uh, possible approaches to the issue did help. And uh, that's what we are trying to build now in, in the ASEAN. And we have similar coordination uh, with other uh, agencies, including uh, those with, with Japan, with uh, uh, FTC with Australia and so on. It's it, it, it's uh, the way forward. Okay, th thank you, Marilu and RC. Uh, let me now call Robert Ian McEwen from Australian National University. Hi, Ian. Hi, everyone, and hi, Jim. Hi, you, Ian. You, you, Look, uh, what, what you, you've been talking about today is, I think, a really fundamental problem, particularly for developing countries. And uh, incorporated in, in, in that, uh, in the point I'm going to make, and perhaps some of the other one, uh, points that other people were making, is the importance of how you trade off static efficiency with dynamic efficiency. You know, a lot of uh, people who write about uh, antitrust and, and uh, developing countries argue that we really should be trying to promote 
uh, dynamic efficiency as, as our operational model for competition law. The problem is, of course, that the American competition or antitrust laws were developed in the 19th century at a time when they were really developed for populist uh, ends rather than economic. And it's only really been over 100 years or so that the economic has come to the fore. But to deal with the for courts and the legal system to deal with economics requires them to use th the simplest type of economics, which is to look at um, price cost margins, static efficiency, et cetera, and to largely ignore dynamic efficiencies. Now, of course, competition agencies will take them into account in deciding whether to prosecute or not. But the reality is the courts have great difficulties in, in, in dealing with these subjects because largely most, most judges who deal with these, uh, with these cases, even in established developed country jurisdictions, have very limited economics. Now, I, I actually now have come to the conclusion that it's probably best that antitrust only look at, uh, in, yeah, that is through the legal system, only look at, uh, um, at cartels because it's relatively simple to determine whether people are colluding, et cetera, compared to determining the likely effect of the mergers and the likely impact of, uh, of, of dominant firms' conduct. And I, I really believe there should be a, an alternative institutional model which deals with both mer mergers and with abuse of dominance. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that? Have you thought about alternative models, but which can help then to create, uh, to solve the coordination problem that a number of speakers have been uh, talking about or asking about today? That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just point out that uh, going back to the price cost margins, uh, the paradigm for policy reform is understanding the nature, causes, and consequences of existing policies. And so on the dynamics, we really need to have metrics for what's standing in the way of more specialization and investment coordination. So I think that's the first step before we can get even to the the causes and the consequences. Yeah, and then from there, we can go to what that means for uh, cartel enforcement uh, versus abusive dominance and things like that, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another question from one of the audience. May I call on Alan uh, Junior Ophemia? Would you like to ask the question yourself? that you posted on the chat. You may unmute and show yourself. Alan, are you still there? Okay, Alan, I will read your question. Um, Jim, this is the question. How can, how can regulatory bod bodies effectively harmonize competition policies with regards to a pandemic exit plan of each government, both in the developed and developing states? Yeah, I, I think that, as I said, the, the administrative order on formulating a competition policy uh, provides an instrument for coordinating across agencies because already you have there the mandate for NADA and PCC to coordinate and also other agencies. So that's that would be one place to look. I don't know if RC wants to comment on that as well. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this uh, administrative order that Jim uh, is mentioning is the one that uh, was issued by the Office of the President last uh, October. No? So it's quite new. And we are still uh, in the process of uh, uh, um, organizing ourselves. Uh, um, uh, uh, putting in place the uh, the mechanisms to uh, implement that uh, order, uh, and it's a very uh, interesting order and very promising because indeed it uh, gives uh, or it empowers uh, uh, the uh, the PCC and NIDA to coordinate uh, and ensure that uh, 
uh, agencies in government uh, while uh, uh, in or in the pursuit of their mandates uh, they do not uh, that they do not trample on competition and uh, that uh, the objectives of the agency uh, uh, should not come at the expense of another uh, agency objective which is in our case is the competition mandate so it's a very uh, prom promising one um, i am not aware of any jurisdiction in the in other parts of this world of the world that has that kind of uh, uh, arrangement right now um, so it's uh, it, 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 it is indeed uh, going to be uh, 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 very useful moving forward okay uh, we can entertain one more question from the audience perhaps one from the students anybody you may raise your hand or show yourself and unmute yourself okay um Sutad so um, still has comment. Sutad? So yes. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, I like to circle back to the point about on the demand side. I feel that there's, there must be some balance at the end. Uh, yeah, I think uh, COVID vaccination is a very good example of how one, uh, you know, the technology is driving. Um, uh, but we, at the end of the day, we have to protect ourselves. That's the uh, that's lesson we learn. And the consumer ourselves have to learn how to protect ourselves. And we need more information. And I think the policy support right now on the demand side, on the consumer side, is very, very, very limited. And we lack the understanding. Because when, when Jim was uh, talking about the uh, uh, the transition, the global transition. I think the service sector is is actually uh, the major source of growth going forward. And frankly, what is driving the service sector is the demand side. You look at the the, the consumption we have, the pattern we uh, uh, we have on the daily life. It is very much demand driven, but we understand the demand side very little. And actually, it's about us, the consumer itself. And we are not uh, well organized, but I think the, the, the when we look at the growth theory and so forth, we emphasize more on the on, on the supply side, and and this rightly so. Uh, but there are less technology on on the demand side, and of course, right now we have uh, this international uh, uh, access to the market and so forth uh, competition within a country may be as less important as Lou pointed out. Cross-border competition is becoming much more important, but we have little tools across country to, to manage that. And we have to start from the consumer. I feel that we are less protected coming from the rice consumer market. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words before we close? Respond to that. Um, just to add that, yeah, I should have pointed out that in addition to the structural transformation driving productivity, there's, of course, productivity within each of the sectors. And as the service sector becomes large, that becomes an increasingly important source of growth. Um, yeah. Um, I think Sutad is opening up another area to look into. Um, the nature of consumption has changed so much. So I can, I can buy rice from Pakistan in a small quantity and have it sent to my house. So yeah, these are, these are things how we should look into how the economy is changing. Okay, um, we had a very productive exchange this morning and I hope for the students that inspired you to go into competition and competition economics. And with that, I'd like to announce that Ateneo de Manila University has started to offer competition policy and law as an undergraduate interdisciplinary elective. I think it's starting this semester. 
Um, so hopefully that can develop more into something. And PCC is always looking for an economist. So you may want to work at PCC. And before we close, I would like to request everyone to turn on their camera for our usual photo session at the end of every seminar. Um, while you are fixing yourself and your smile, let me invite you to next um, seminar which will be on um, policy reform options for Indonesia in the post-COVID era with some implications for the Philippines. And our speaker is Professor Hal Hill from Australian National University. And that will be on February 23, um, 2002, also on a Wednesday. And um, all our seminars are now posted on YouTube. You can find it in Ateneo de Manila University YouTube channel. You can find the playlist in that YouTube and channel. And for those of you who are requesting um, certificate, um, you can send your request by um, accomplishing the form posted in the screen. That's the link. And I think um, Tweetums is also sending the link to the chat box. And for those of you who are asking where to find the materials for this seminar, it will be uploaded on our website, except that our website is currently transitioning to a new and more um, active and dynamic website. So please wait for it probably in the next couple of days or at the latest next week. So are we all ready?